game director. Game director. Game director. Yeah. There's something going into the show that I think a lot of people have heard of. Uh, we're going to be something Yeah. And you want to describe it to me? Sure. Yeah. It's pretty new. I think we've announced three weeks ago or so. So it's really recent. Um, act third person action adventure game. Yeah. Uh, kind of the, all the classics, all the stuff we know, how they work. Yeah. But this time it's set in the browser. It runs just straight in a window in your browser. Um, yeah. It's free to play and it features user generated content. There are no extra tools. Anything you see in there that we feel that the game ships with, you can create in there too. Yeah. We close beta right now and there's loads of levels already popping up. Yeah. So it's browser based. Uh, direct, I mean, is, it, is there a plugin you have to download yeah, for it? There's a small plugin called the Square Enix Secure Launcher, which sets everything off. Yeah. Uh, I think it's about 80k or so, and then it just goes from there. Yeah. We stream the rest in. Wow. So, I mean, we you showed us something earlier on. I mean, it's this is different from other browser games. Like, and guys nodding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think pretty much all of us came with a uh, console development background to this project. So yeah. I think. That was just that's the kind of games we make, right? So uh, what you worked on? You, did you work on uh, the Ninja thing? Was that you? Mini Ninja. Mini Ninja. Was that you? No, peripherally. I worked on Kane and Lynch back at, back at okay. IO, and I was at um, Lionhead before IO. Oh, okay. Earlier. Which which Lionhead you game, game do you work on? Uh, I joined right around the end of Black and White One, and then. Oh wow, that's a while ago. Yes, it's a while. Oh wow. Okay. So. Um, you must be older than you look. Also, by the way, oh, I thank must you. thank the guy that emailed me. <laughs> Uh, on the bonus stage email address and said that I look like Brad Shoemaker from Giant Bomb's dad. <laughs> so apparently I look ancient now. I, I would say distinguished. Distinguished? Say distinguished. Yes. Going for the salt and pepper beard. Yeah. Maybe at the end of the week, you know. Maybe I'm going to look haggard by the end of the week. <laughs> we all will. <laughs> So Black and White won? No, I didn't really contribute to Black and White no. 1. It was, it was shipping right when I joined. Yeah. Um, but then I mean, we started off loads of projects after that. There yeah. the movies, this, uh, Fable came, came into Lionhead, and we had other things going on uh, that, that I worked on too. Wow. I think Dimitri is the code name for one of, one of the big things we did back then. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Fantastic. Dwayne Guy, what are you working on now? Can you say? All this stuff's top secret. <laughs> it is top secret, um, a lot of it. but. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the games are here, which are great, and um, are getting you know some pretty good responses. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. One of the things I learned, like there was, uh, you know, one of the games I worked on, um, you know, was getting quite strong response, and you know, it was something I saw in the last few weeks, and you know, so it's like I'm seeing it in various stages of unfinishedness. And do you want to just explain for people that don't know what you do, kind sure, of what your absolutely. what your gig is now? Yeah. So I, when you and I met, I was a journalist. So I was um, covering uh, consumer technology for Newsweek, which I did for 14 years. And as part of that, I wrote about video games. Yeah. Um, in 2009, I left Newsweek and started a company called Hit Detection, uh, consulting for uh, publishers and developers um, on games in various stages of development. So anywhere from the concept and ideation phases all the way through um, beta. And we also work on uh, on free-to-play games, so there the real work starts after the game ships, yeah. right? So we now work on games well after they ship. Plus, even on console games, there's you know DLC and other things, so we're involved with that kind of stuff. And so, the short version of what we do is is that we go visit a developer, um, we meet with them and hear from their mouths like what it is they're trying to achieve. So review the creative pillars of their game. Uh, we play whatever they have playable. If it's really early, it might just be prototypes. Um, if it's you know beta, then obviously there's like a complete game that's playable from beginning to end, maybe some bugs. And then uh, you know me and my team, uh, you know we play through as much as possible, and you know we write up a report, yeah. basically sort of saying like, here's what works, here's what doesn't work so well, and here's some recommendations on how to fix it. And then of course everyone wants to know what their meta score is gonna be, so you know <laughs> yeah, I Hey, I, I just I don't actually Metacritic doesn't report to me anymore. We moved it into a different group at CBS, so there were a couple of things during some of the press conferences where I think it was during the Sony press conference, they right. mentioned the meta score of Journey and a bunch of people tweeted at me like <laughs> oh, you must be pleased about that. I'm like, I mean, I, I, I love Mark, but unfortunately, I'm not his boss anymore. <laughs> well, look, I'm, I'm biased, I guess, in that, you know, meta, Metacritic is one of the things that one could say keeps us in business. Yeah. But the fact is, even if it didn't exist, 
publishers would create it themselves anyway, right? They would use it as a, they would create their own Metacritic as an internal tool to help them because they need some measures of the critical consensus of the quality of their game. Right. Now that doesn't mean oftentimes, as I'm sure you probably heard before you started working at GameSpot and CBS and like and after you were no longer responsible for them, I'm sure you've heard all kinds of things about how people feel about it yeah. in the industry. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is like there this would exist whether or not um, the creator of Metacritic had done it anyway. Yeah. And I'm sure before, they were already doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. So for us, the thing that's funny about it is from my end, when I went into this, I was very high-minded and very naive. And I said to my very first client, so here's what we're gonna do, here are the deliverables we're gonna provide. Um, we're not gonna do a meta, we're not gonna do a meta score forecast. And the person was like, yes, you are. I was like, no, because we really want people to focus on the feedback. And that's like, that's all well good, but we do want, um, I was like, no, I was like, yes. And like, ever since then, it's not an argument anymore. Everyone wants it. Yeah. You just know all they do is they look at that number. Like. Well, that's the, that's the, I mean, it's easy to say that's the unfortunate thing, but you have to look at it from the publisher's perspective. The, the challenge of succeeding in the marketplace it, and there's so much competition, not even just within consoles, where I'm sure if one counted up the number of games, there are fewer, you know, big budget AAA console games being released on a year over year basis. But you have all these genres that have sprung up, you know, since like five, six, seven years ago. So mobile is a big thing now, and social is a big thing now, and free to play premium games, and MMOs, and all these other things. So. There's all of this competition for people's time, and you know, you have all these divisions of the company that are trying to, you have PR and marketing and you know, development and the executives, and everyone's trying to sort of get a sense of where it's going to come in so they can figure out whether to put more resources into it, put more time into it, or sometimes to scale it back and basically say, like, there's not too much we can do here, right? But the, the biggest thing for me, I think, is I, I now find myself dealing with a number of clients that, you know, everyone, there's a feeling right now in the industry that 80 rated games don't sell. Games rated in the 80s don't sell. Now, that's obviously not true. If you look at Max Payne, Max Payne on 360 is an 86 Metascore, right? Um, it's selling really well, yeah. right? And you have some games that'll get into the 90s and just don't move the needle. But that's a real thing. So like now, I find that there are people who, you know, to go in, they're saying it's like, yes, and our goal is 90 plus. And I'm like, well, if your organization hasn't shipped a 90 rated game, and the studio working on the game hasn't shipped a 90 rated game, like, and we both are agreed that where you're at isn't a 90 rated game, how are you gonna get there? Yeah. Right, so like part of what we have to do sometimes is, is just have a come to Jesus moment yeah. with, all of the stakeholders and be like, let's reset this so that, you know, if that score is really important to you, then you're gonna have to give the time and resources to get there, Yeah, you know? So you guys are both coming at, I mean, this seems to be a, a problem for people that are involved in the making of games, that you two are coming at from very different angles. And that is that people aren't going from one game to the next game to the next game the way they used to. I mean, I've been doing games media for 20 something years and back when I was in magazines, people would buy a new game every month. And it would be like, you know, you put out these reports that were like, the average so-and-so reader buys 14 games a year and spends this much money. Now you have users that buy one game, like Call of Duty, and just play it enormously, or they play an MMO, or they want to be involved in something that they can participate in and contribute. I mean, that's where, where you're coming that's in this, going, yeah. where it's, industry seems very reluctant to hand the keys over to the audience the way other industries are, have, are for, like, and part of it seems to be the games are very complicated, we couldn't possibly, like, bother the audience for trying to do that, but I mean, you, your, the tools that you're giving them are, are pretty pretty thorough, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think you have to kind of embrace that, uh, to let the audience in and, and hand them the keys to the asylum, if, yeah. if you like, you know. Uh, um, it's so important for a game like the one we're doing, where we want the users to engage with the product, not just to be entertained by playing, but also to create things in there and kind of take this product forward. Yeah. That we speak to them, that we listen to them, 
that we work out what they want. Sometimes, of course, we will still be creating stuff that, that we feel is important for the game and kind of move it forward. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of like, you know, not uh, maxing out on our own stuff, making sure that we've got the bandwidth to actually listen to them and, and see where they want to take this thing. So how, I mean, how far can you, can a user of your of game globe go? I mean, like, what is it all the same kind of game or is it... Well, I think when we started it, I mean, we thought of it as, okay, we're going to make a third-person action-adventure game, but you'll be able to make your own levels. Yeah. But it turns out that if you give the users a tool, they will use the tool to create what they have in mind. Yeah. So we've already now, we're seeing users do all kinds of things that, that we didn't think them possible. They're beginning to force it in those directions. Some people have created, you know, indirect controls, or there's a kind of a clone of Angry Birds in there, and yeah. other things. So, so what we want to do is we want to look at this and we want to listen to them and say, okay, they seem to be wanting that kind of control, let's put that in there too. Yeah. So, we'll, I mean, it's funny because you can't contain the users, they will find ways to do what they want to yeah. do. Is that something that you're finding there's a lot of discomfort around, or are, are, are the people you're working with more open to the, I mean, because clearly there's, you know, with the mod, I mean, like, we have a show on GameSpot which is just about Skyrim mods, and it's the most popular piece of content we have some weeks because it's like, it's reflect, people want to be part of the community, they want it to be celebrated, they want to share it and have people talk about it, And but there seems to still be a reluctance. Well, you know, part of the challenge is, um, like something like what, uh, what, what you're working on is, your game is built from the ground up with that intent. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of games like where that would have to be retrofit onto it, and so that may not always be achievable. And then there are others, like you said, where it's exactly that. It's a conceptual sort of challenge. Um, and then part of it is, do you have enough, a big enough community to, you know, for your game, like where that sort of structure really makes sense, right? So, you know, if you look at an audience of scale of, say, a Call of Duty, you know, giving people the ability to create their own uh, uh, game type variations, will have a different impact than, say, a shooter that has a fraction of the audience. Yeah. So there are a lot of things that go into that, but I think, I mean, looking at the success that Valve has had with um, Team Fortress 2, you know, the whole, like, you know, the whole crafting of objects and the in-game marketplace and, like, all of those things, and that being carried over into other games, so I believe in uh, Dota 2, um, they'll be able to craft and sell objects and things like that. Um, I really feel like that We'll see more of that, but you know, as you know, it's like there's a, fer a fair amount of conservatism in, yeah. the, in, the, in the industry, and like finding those ways to changes in AAA games, especially when the risks are so high. Just sort of getting your standard, you know, campaign and multiplayer modes right. But a lot of people are not willing, able, or ready to take on those risks. So, I mean, that's a good segue to kind of how I want to kind of wrap this up, is that, I mean, on, if you read on Twitter during the press conference yesterday, the prevailing opinion seems to be, when is somebody going to man up at E3? Like, what, what's going on and why? It's, it's the same stuff. We asked people to uh, summarize the press conferences in three words on Twitter, and uh, that you should have seen the number of people that put same old shit as the thing that, that, that <laughs> is like, there's that conservatism is like is, is probably more tangible than ever this year. I mean, have you guys did you guys see stuff in the in the stuff yesterday that you were impressed by? I weren't actually at the conferences. No. Did you so, watch them online? No, so far I've only read the commentary. But it is interesting because I think you sum it up very well there. Um, people seem to have walked away without feeling they've seen anything new. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing them. I mean, I kind of enjoy seeing them. Uh, it's hard to know what to expect when, when you see the reactions. Yeah. So well, I would say on a practical level, there's some challenges around uh, showing off new and innovative stuff right now. So, as, among console developers, the general feeling and publishers, the general feeling is that the start of a new generation is the best time to unveil that. Yeah. And since Microsoft and Sony chose not to introduce new hardware here. Um, a lot of third-party publishers, and obviously the first parties themselves, are holding back. Yeah. Uh, now, 
Sony is still like Last of Us is a new IP. Um, PlayStation All Stars is a new IP. Um, not saying that that's necessarily the innovation that people are looking for, but those aren't new IPs. You know, Sony. You know, a year later than Microsoft had some troubles in the beginning, still trying to drive hardware. You know, they've typically supported their hardware a bit longer than some of the other competitors in the marketplace. But for third parties, here's the math they're dealing with now. We're already halfway through the year. You've got one quarter, like basically through September, when Halo is traditionally shipped. It's gonna ship later this year. But basically, if you have a new IP, and maybe it's going to come in in the 80s, right? Yeah. 70s and 80s. Um, what's your window to release that? You don't want to put it out in the fall quarter, right, in the holiday quarter, um, September to December. That's really dangerous. And then we've all seen how many games are either slipped or deliberately oh, being put into Oh, everything is pushed into, into Q1 now, yeah. So now, essentially, if you're a new IP and you're on current-gen machines, you have a... Depending on how you look at it, you have three months between next um, April to June before the hype train starts for next generation. Yeah. And then another quarter after that, while people are still recovering from the hype, if those machines aren't out, it's threading the needle for game development, especially when predicting a shift date for a new IP is even more challenging for something that's traditional. So I think I think that's part of the reason why this is very much a sort of running in place show yeah. is because the bets that publishers and developers have to make on these games are so high that a lot of people are saying like, look, let's take risk out of it. Let's put out the stuff that's safer, that we know is gonna do well, and keep our powder dry on the new and innovative stuff for when PlayStation, whatever it's gonna be called, the next one and the next Xbox are gonna be more visible. Great, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming. Um, let's give out your Twitter names. What's your Twitter handle? You want to spell it for people? R U N E B E N D L E R. All right, remember? And, and mine is N Kroll, N C R O A L. All right, this is the bonus stage on GameSpot. Uh, I'm your host, John Davison. Uh, JWH Davison is my Twitter. Coming up in about five minutes, we've got the leads from all the GameSpot brands around the world. We're going to do a little show wrap up for the day on the stuff that they've been seeing. Uh, that'll be in about five minutes. I'm sorry, just one more. Sharply.